So I just wanted to talk to you. I've, I've heard you mention that uh, without God, life is meaningless. Do you agree with that? If there is no God, life is ultimately meaningless. I can create my own meaning, but that's obviously meaningless, the meaning that I create. Okay, so what is the, the meaning that God gives life? You bet. God, I am convinced, created you with innate worth. So you have an innate worth. It doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from a culture that says, because you're a really smart guy, you're valuable. Instead, because you're a human being created in the likeness of God, you have innate worth that nobody can take away from you. Nobody can take a vote and say, you're not worth anything, and be correct. They're wrong. Secondly, God created you for a purpose, which is to love and worship Him and to love and serve others, according to Christ. So, that is why you're worthwhile and that is why you have purpose, because God created you with that worth and He created you for purpose. It sounds like, for you, meaning is still an arbitrary thing, but it arbitrarily comes from God. Would you say that's right? No. What's God's reason for giving us that meaning? I would say that because an intelligent being created you to reflect his glory, rationality, conscience, creativity, love, that you have an innate value that comes from the eternal God. Secondly, because you're not pond scum evolved to a higher order, because you've been created for a purpose to love and worship God and to love and serve others, your life really does have significance. Um, it still sounds like God arbitrarily has decided that what our meaning is and give, told us that that is what makes our life meaningful. Whether we yeah. personally would, whether that meaning would make us happy. Like, for example, to praise God for eternity wouldn't make me happy. That seems like a pretty meaningless existence and a really long one, too. Okay, good. Great point. Have you ever been in love with a woman? When you were in love with a woman, did you praise her? Uh, a little, I guess. When you praised her, was that boring, dull, and monotonous? Um, well, I would say no, because I didn't do it for eternity. Okay. When, <laughs> when I communicate love to my wife and praise her and love to my sons and praise them, I can promise you, sir, that is the antithesis of boring, drab, and dull. Instead, that is the zenith, that is the appropriate expression of my love. And I love to watch a big, tough football player fall in love with a little petite girl, woman. And I love to watch him stumble all over himself and almost drool at the mouth, praising her. At times, it sounds like sentimental slop. But I can promise you, if I look that big guy in the face who's not very articulate and who's stumbling all over himself and drooling at the mouth to communicate his love, and I say, pretty dull, isn't it? He'd say, you've got to be kidding me. I really love this person, and praise is the appropriate expression of my love. So, sir, I can promise you the only reason I praise God is because I love him, which means my praising God is the antithesis of boarding, drab, and dull. Okay, that might be a, a difference between you and I. I, you bet. I would find that to be pretty boring. Um, and a God that really creates a bunch of people and then tells them that their meaning is to praise Him, I don't think reflects very well on God Himself. Oh, okay. 
Well, the first point is, God doesn't create us simply to sit around saying, I praise you, I praise you, I praise you for eternity. Instead, in heaven we will be working, we will be serving, we will be exercising creativity, we will be gregariously building relationships both with God and with others. So I would encourage you to ask yourself, what brings me the most joy in life? It, are there going to be an infinite number of people in heaven? Because eternity is like a really long time to build relationships. And I, I just, it seems like the way heaven is thought of is, is pretty finite and it just seems like it'd get really boring after a while. Especially if there is a, a God who is omniscient and knows everything, which I think that the only way you can know that you know everything is if, you know, the universe is finite. So heaven just seems really boring to me. But that's kind of a tangent. Back to the main issue, meaningfulness. I still don't see how a God in the sky telling us what meaning, what, what, life, what the meaning of life is would be more, would make life more meaningful than us having a natural sense of the meaning of life. Even if it, even if we can't really say, you know, we can ask, well, why is that meaningful? Why is that meaningful ad infinitum? And eventually it just is meaningful. And I, I would say, you know, because it evolved that way. Um, why would a mysterious individual through an ancient group of people and through current evangelical types telling us what makes life meaningful, why would that be more meaningful than evolution telling us what is meaningful about life? Okay, what does evolution tell you is the meaning of life? Well, I would say that the ultimate meaning of life is to replicate yourself and do it better than the next guy. And I would say that human altruism is an evolved trait because that is actually adaptive for people in groups, for a political species like ourselves. So the kindness and the love that we feel for each other is an, an adaptive trait because a person where everyone around them trusts them as someone who loves them, I would say is in a safer position than somebody that nobody trusts. So it's actually a really adaptive um, quality. And I, you know, a lot of uh, research has gone into trying to understand um, these things like love and feelings of altruism and behaviors that just mo morality itself, and it can be explained evolutionarily. And evolution is something that has been documented very well. It's, it's really a fact of nature and there's just, it can't be denied anymore. And so it's a very good paradigm for explaining design in the universe. And so I would say that that would be a better naturalistic explanation of the meaningfulness of life than another arbitrary um, source of meaning, which is a God as defined by an ancient book and some evangelical types. What do you say to that? I say that although producing babies is fun and good, there's got to be more to life than producing babies. I say that if you're going to be consistent with your worldview, but to be altruism, fair, I wasn't just saying that producing babies was the only. No, that was your first point, and I'm going on to your second. Point. Okay. And your second point was that altruism makes sense because it helps people trust you. Well, guess what? I could give a rip about whether you trust me or not. I've got 60 to 80 years to live on this planet. I want as much money in order to take as many vacations and buy as many boats and go on many ski trips as I can. And I think that's precious that you think altruism is nice. But if it's true that I've got 60 to 80 years and then the fertilizer pit, for me it's far more rational to get as much as I can and to have as much fun as I can. Okay, an important like I, I don't I think for I think anybody would agree that the most like having the most fun getting a lot of stuff does make people feel good, but the love of other people makes them feel better. And I think that that's something that people um, dedicate a lot of resources just because it it makes them feel good and we like it has a biochemical 
effect in our minds that evolved as a reinforcement of that behavior because it makes you feel good. It's, and I, I think that, okay, so that's kind of mysterious. Why do we feel good when we do nice things for people and when they reciprocate? Um, that can be explained evolutionarily. We don't need a God to explain that. And whereas in the pre-evolution time of our history, the way we explained that reality, as long, along with a lot of other reality, was with um, positing a, an agency behind it, an intelligence behind it to explain it. But we don't need that anymore because we actually have a very robust, good mechanism that can develop that same type of thing. If there is no God, I think that B.F. Skinner and the behaviorists win the story, win the day. If there is no God, I am simply complex biochemical reactions evolved to a higher order, which means there is no such thing as an intangible value of love. There are certain biochemical reactions that I have in my brain that I happen to call love, which means love is not a free decision. Love is a biochemical reaction in my brain, and I just do what I am biochemically predisposed to do. Yeah. My experience of life contradicts that. The life that I live is I am very, very sorely tempted to hate and cut the knees out from underneath people who hurt me deeply. I am hardwired to seek revenge, and not to forgive, not to love my enemy. My experience of life is that I can choose to follow my conscience instead of following my instinct, the voices that are going off in my head when someone hurts me, Rocky, Rocky, Rocky blast that rascal into the next century. I can follow that, or I can follow forgiving my enemy, forgiving the person who has cut me off at the knees. And I can promise you, sir, that is an intense struggle that I go through on a fairly regular basis. Okay, and, and you know, I, I think I, it would be overstating to say every attribute of our personality is genetic. Um, the fundamental attributes of our personality are genetic, but the bulk of our personality is a learned thing that we learn from our culture and our society that we develop in. But that's still a physical phenomenon. And to say, um, you know, love is uh, non-physical, anyway, that, that's, you can't demonstrate that. I mean, you can demonstrate brain damage that destroys a person's ability to love. And, um, well, I think I should leave it at that. Um, I think there, there is just overwhelming evidence that our personality is uh, an attribute of the brain. And, I, I mean, nobody without a brain is... Can love. Can love, sure. Good. Um, okay. And that's where you and I part company. I am convinced that if you did a lobotomy on me, you could radically alter my behavior. I am convinced that if you injected chemicals in my body, you could radically alter my behavior. Yes, I agree with you. We have physical bodies, and by altering the brain chemically or through surgery, you can radically change a person's personality. No question about that. My point is simply this. When you finish writing up the chemical analysis of the human brain, you have not told the whole story. There still is a soul, a person, a me, an I that can stand back and judge how I respond to my genetic makeup, how I respond to my environment. In fact, I have the utmost respect for people who contradict their culture, contradict the environment they grew up in. Be it a Gandhi, a Dr. Martin Luther King, obviously they chose to follow their conscience instead of their culture, their environment. And that's what I experience. Well, Gandhi was educated in England. Yeah, but he still was incredibly self-reflective, acknowledging that when he lived in South Africa, he adopted racist attitudes. And finally, Gandhi thought through his racist attitudes and realized that was really wrong of me. And he moved out of that racism. So he had a tremendous ability to follow his conscience instead of following the cultural status quo. I respect that. I trust all of us respect that highly. And obviously, white America was saying, 
Shut up, King. Down, black boy. Get back in place. And Dr. King said, I am not going to blow you away with a gun, but I will peacefully stand against racism, oppressing a human being created in the image of God. And by the way, you white Christians, you need to take your Jesus more seriously. You don't need to shelve Jesus and get rid of him. Instead, you need to take the Jesus you say you believe in more seriously and realize that in the parable of the Good Samaritan, he makes a direct frontal attack on racism, and you better break with your culture. You better break with the environment you were raised in. And you better learn to respect all people of all ethnic heritages, because we're all created in the image of God. That was his whole argument. Uh, well, we respect so, that, yeah, don't yeah. we? Yeah, our, our ethics really have evolved from the Old Testament time when it was okay to kill women and children if your God said it was okay. No, it was not. Yeah, he no. he commanded the Israelites to kill women and children in Jericho. That's That was a commandment. Nothing alive was to remain afterwards. And what was Jericho? It was, it was a Canaanite city. It was a fort. They marched With around women and times. children in it. Pardon? It had women and children no, in it. No, it had Rahab in there, who was a tavern keeper and a prostitute. It had women and children. The commandment was to kill everything. Yes. Man, woman, and child. That's right. That, that's a commandment from God. And that, that was evil. That was an evil commandment from God. Nowadays, we all feel that that's evil. There was a time not too long ago when it was considered sanctioned by God to own other people. Um, but we've progressed beyond that. How have we progressed beyond that? That's a really interesting question. I think that it probably stems from our natural feelings of empathy that a lot of us have. And I think that that has been built up as a moral philosophy. But Christianity has been there from the beginning and it, all it has done is reflected the cultural morality of its time. Is that what William Wilberforce did? Um, yes, he, he was a Christian like almost everybody else, but Christianity has been used to support evil and good at the same time. Yes. Just because it only reflecting the cultural morality at the time. I totally disagree. <laughs> so the you can use it to justify anything. The vast majority of Christians are in China and Asia, South America and Africa today. They are not Christians because mom and dad were. They are breaking with their culture and following Jesus Christ in a new way. And that is why Christianity, the center of Christianity, has moved ago. from Jerusalem and Antioch down to North, Northern Africa, up to Western Europe and the United States, and now the United States and the West are no longer the center of Christianity. Rather, the center of faith in Jesus Christ is in Asia, Africa, and South America. There are far more followers of Christ there. Yeah, but still, these uh, cultures in Asia are a lot more moral now than, and they're largely atheistic or at least non-Christian. They are orders of magnitude more moral now than Christian cultures 200 years ago were. That tells you nothing about Jesus Christ. It tells you something sure. about Christianity. I think you'd be a fool to put your faith in Christianity. Christianity's Christianity has been used people, to yeah. justify the Crusades, the Inquisition, Salem witch trials, racism, but Jesus Christ justifies none of that. And when you put your faith in Christ, the way so many Africans, so many Asians, so many South Americans are, it radically changes your life, not so that you become part of the Salem witch hunt, or the Crusades of the Inquisition, but rather that you learn to love people and respect people. Why? Because they're created in the image of God. Okay, well, I, I think I better you let bet. the next guy in. But here, thanks. It is so sad to watch people burst into flames and go down to temptation and to defeat. But one of the things that I love about the Bible is that it records exactly that type of crash and burn defeat. One of the examples of that is the Apostle Peter. Peter looked into the face of Christ at one point and said, I will never deny you. I will go to the death for you. And Jesus warned him and said, watch out, Peter. You're going to deny knowing me three times before the cock crows. And Peter said, no way. And yet, when Christ was arrested, 
Peter followed him to the home where he was tried, the home of Annas and Caiaphas. And as he was warming himself beside a fire, a little servant girl came up and said, Wait a second. I recognize you as one of those Christ followers. And Peter denied knowing it. A second time he denied it. A third time he denied knowing it. The cock crowed. Peter was overcome with guilt, overcome with shame. He had gone down, crashing and burning in defeat. Why? Why did Peter crash and burn? Why did he give in to temptation and go down to defeat in that way? Many different reasons. But one of the first reasons I lean towards believing, because I've seen it in my own life and in the lives of others, is he didn't listen carefully to what Jesus taught. That's just like me. It's amazing how easy it is for me to allow the teachings of Christ to go in one ear and out the other ear. And if we don't take the teachings of Christ seriously and focus on Him, we can be unprepared for the challenges and the temptations of this life. When you and I put our faith in Christ, there's a conflict that goes on in us. The conflict is between the old nature and the new nature, the old way of life and the new way of life. And it's amazingly easy for me to be adjusted to the greed the materialism, the cynicism, the unbelief in my culture. And so the challenge is to listen carefully to Christ, to listen very carefully, and then to begin to obey Him in every area. And that's hard. It's hard for us living in an American culture to obey Christ's teachings on sexuality. Often people judge me with a litmus test, and that litmus test is, how open are you, Cliff? to free sex, to sex in any way that I choose to experience it. And when I begin to communicate that sex is a beautiful gift from God to be enjoyed within the context of a lifelong commitment between one man and one woman till death parts them, all of a sudden I'm crossed off. And there's amazing emotional pressure from the media, from our culture to say, when it comes to sex, do anything as long as it's between two consenting adults. But no, Jesus warns, don't do that. So draw boundary lines to make sure that you don't fall in to sexual immorality by being tempted. So I'm afraid it's easy for you and me, and it was definitely easy for Peter, to be unprepared for the challenge of temptation because they didn't listen carefully to Jesus. A second reason that I think it's quite possible that Peter crashed and burned, going down in defeat to temptation is, because he was overconfident in himself. Now, quiet determination is great. Commitment made to remain faithful is laudable. But I have to remember that my feet are of clay. I can crash and burn. Temptation can hit me and I can give in. And I do give in to temptation too frequently. That is why I consistently need to go over my life with a fine tooth comb being genuinely sorry for the wrong that I do, turning to Christ, asking Him for forgiveness, and asking Him for the power to change. Cocky overconfidence sets me up for a big spiritual fall. Humility coupled with realism is so healthy. To remember that I have feet of clay and to remember that there but for the grace of God go I is crucial. I depend upon Christ to help me stand against temptation. I need to be filled with God's Holy Spirit to have the spiritual muscle to say no to temptation. And thirdly, I think there's another reason that Peter crashed and burned. It's because he failed to watch and pray. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said to Peter, watch and pray, the spirit is willing but the body is weak. And Peter drifted off to sleep. That's me too often, drifting off to sleep getting comfortable, forgetting to meditate, forgetting to cry out to God for strength and for help, and becoming apathetic. No, Jesus says, watch and pray. Watch. What does that mean? Well, watch the culture around you. Watch the world around you. Watch go what's going on within you. Be skeptical. Analyze. Be analytical. Understand what is happening. Don't blindly, gullibly, walk into temptation. 
Instead, watch, observe, analyze, critique your culture, your environment, your desires within you. Watch. And then Jesus said, pray. Prayer is essentially an acknowledgement of my need of God's help. I need power from on high. I need a higher power. I need God to help me to do what's right. For too frequently, I know what's right, but I do the opposite. I do that which is wrong. I need God's help. I need the Holy Spirit. And prayer is crying out from the depth of my being, God, have mercy on me. Help me. Strengthen me. Prayer builds intimacy with God. Prayer builds spiritual muscle. So Jesus says, watch and pray. Root yourself in me, Christ says, and I will help you deal with temptation so that you don't cave in to peer pressure. You don't cave in to your own twisted desires. You don't cave in to the lies of the world around you. You don't cave in to the deception of the great deceiver, Satan, Lucifer, the devil. Instead, with your eyes firmly focused on Christ, empowered by His grace and by His Holy Spirit, you begin to live a life that is truly good as God defines good. Have you begun that process by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Have you begun that process by asking Christ to forgive you for the wrong that you've done, acknowledging that you've got feet of clay? Have you begun that process by trusting that Christ died on the cross for you? Have you begun that process by asking Him to fill you with His Holy Spirit? You could begin that process right now if you have not already. Simply but profoundly ask Christ for forgiveness. Put your faith in Him that He bled and died on the cross for your sin. Trust Him for heaven and open up your heart, your soul, to His Holy Spirit. God bless you as you make that most important decision. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 at Saks Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile and take a right into Saks Middle School. Won't you join us this Sunday for our 9.30 service? Have a great day.